Hello, everyone. I'm Lana Zak. Thank you so much for joining me. We begin this hour in Israel, where defense officials are defending the country's latest offensive in Gaza. Israel Defense Forces conducted an airstrike on a prominent high-rise building in Gaza City on Saturday. The bombing leveled the structure, which had housed several media outlets, including the Associated Press and Al Jazeera. Israeli defense officials claim they have evidence Hamas used the building for military assets. Civilians inside the building were given an hour to evacuate before the missile struck. The White House has not issued an official statement on the attack. However, President Biden spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas earlier today. During his call with Netanyahu, Mr. Biden voiced support for Israel's right to defend itself from Hamas and other terrorist groups in Gaza. He also raised concerns over the growing number of civilian casualties. During his call with President Abbas, Mr. Biden discussed plans to strengthen U.S.-Palestinian relations. He pointed to the revitalized efforts by the U.S. to provide support and assistance to the Palestinian people. He also stressed the need for Hamas to cease firing rockets into Israel. At a news conference on Saturday, military officials said chances of a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas are dwindling. A ceasefire now will just help Hamas to recover and we'll end up with the same situation that we are uh, that we were in the day before the operation or the day before this conflict begin, began, which means that Hamas will have the opportunity to start a conflict, a military conflict, whenever uh, they want, and they have the, they will have the opportunity to launch uh, missiles on Israeli citizens and uh, terror attacks on Israeli citizens whenever they choose. Barack Ravid joins me now. He's a diplomatic correspondent at Walla News in Israel and a contributing correspondent for Axios, based in Tel Aviv. Thank you for being with us, Barack. So what new information did you learn from that press, or were there any new details that surprised you? No, I, I don't think, at least to me, there was nothing uh, that was, uh, that was uh, new. Um, I think that this uh, uh, briefing was uh, mostly meant for um, uh, the international press after this, uh, the bombing of this building in Gaza that hosted many uh, media outlets, including the AP. And I think uh, the Israelis were very keen on trying to first explain why they uh, target, targeted this building, and second, to uh, uh, try and do some damage control when it comes to their uh, when it comes to the international press uh, after what happened. Because I think that in recent, or in, in the beginning of this operation, the Israelis were pretty satisfied with the way the international press covered uh, what was going on in Gaza, the missile attacks on Israel. And in the last day or two, uh, at least what I, what I heard from Israeli officials, they were more concerned that the trend was changing. And I think that what happened today, both the attack that killed uh, 10 civilians in Gaza, two women and eight children, and this attack on this uh, building uh, in Gaza, uh, I think they were very, very worried that this would uh, continue to change the trend and that they would get a lot more critical press around the world. I think this is the main reason they uh, did this event. I want to follow up with you on that point, because Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Knurkis from the Israeli Defense Forces said that they have only hit military targets. Um, in particular, he responded to questions about that, that building that houses so many international media outlets. Uh, he said regarding that, that Hamas has embedded their operations inside civilian yes. buildings. What did you make of his response, and also the fact that he said that they could not provide any additional evidence to back up those claims at this time? Well, first, you know, there's one thing that uh, I should uh, uh, say in, in, in the colonel's uh, defense, and this is that uh, when he says that they're uh, only targeting military uh, facilities, uh, he's right. That's their intention. The, the intention of the, the IDF is to target mil only military facilities. The only problem is that in a place like Gaza that is very, very small. And when the population is uh, so dense, uh, it is almost impossible to uh, um, um, engage in airstrikes without uh, hitting civilians. Uh, and this is why 
every Israeli operation in Gaza ends with a big number of civilian casualties. And uh, um, in, at least in my opinion, it's uh, of course that the intention matters, okay? But still, uh, the fact, even if it wasn't the intention and so many civilians uh, are hit, this is, uh, um, this is a major concern. And we also heard the, the colonel um, arguing that uh, Hamas has actually been responsible for killing several of their own people in those civilian deaths with rockets that misfired. What more can you tell us about this? Yeah, that, that's a claim that the Israeli uh, military has been making for several days now. Um, I have no uh, independent information that can corroborate uh, uh, this claim. They claim that something like 30 percent of the rockets fired from Gaza land inside the Gaza Strip because of malfunctions and, and that some of it hits uh, uh, Palestinians and some of the Palestinians that were wounded or killed, uh, uh, it, that it happened because of uh, Hamas or Islamic Jihad rockets. That's their claim. I have no uh, uh, independent information to corroborate it. And uh, the IDF also didn't present any, uh, any such evidence. What we do know, and it's it's very clear for almost forever, that uh, a lot of Hamas's military uh, capabilities are embedded inside civilian uh, areas. Again, it's Gaza. Uh, the same way that uh, um, Israel, uh, you know, it doesn't want to target uh, civilians, but when it's Gaza, it's almost impossible not to target civilians. Uh, the same way uh, when Hamas fires from Gaza, Hamas knows that he's doing it from populated areas. Um, and and I think that there was a lot of evidence over the years of uh, rocket launchers that were found inside, uh, inside residential buildings, inside uh, sometimes there were uh, rocket uh, caches inside UNRWA schools uh, uh, in Gaza. Um, so I think that, again, uh, both Hamas and uh, uh, Israel, at the end of the day, um, uh, are engaged in military activity that harms Palestinian civilians. And this is the tragedy in Gaza, that you have a very large population of almost 2 million people, that most of it is not involved in the fighting, and but it's still suffering yeah, for many, many years and with many uh, people uh, uh, wounded and, and killed. And I want to follow up with you on that point, because President Biden spoke with Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu and the president of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas. In both calls, he expressed concern about civilian casualties, and he also expressed his commitment to a two-state solution. How realistic is that last point, and what role might the U.S. play in brokering peace? Well, first, it's not, re it's, it's not realistic. Uh, I'll tell you more than that. Uh, the phone call between Biden and Abbas, that it took, you know, almost four months for this phone call uh, to take place, which is, in my opinion, quite odd. President Trump called Abbas after two months. Uh, for Biden, it took four months. Very, very odd. Uh, but President Abbas has no influence whatsoever on what's going on in Gaza. He is totally irrelevant. And this call uh, with him that, you know, I think it's important, but it has nothing to do with the current crisis mm -hmm. in Gaza. It does have a lot to do with uh, tensions in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. Those are two places that Abbas can play a major role in trying to lower tensions and uh, de-escalate the situation. Palestinian uh, security forces are under his command in the West Bank, and they can uh, contribute a lot to uh, de-escalating uh, the situation. Uh, but I think that what we, what we saw in this call with Biden is that the U.S. slowly, slowly but steadily is putting more and more pressure uh, on Israel to end fighting, it's not a lot of pressure. It is very polite, very, you know, uh, with a lot of subtext. But the U.S. is telling right. Israel, you're running out of time. 
Speaking of running out of time, uh, we only have a few more moments left, and, and I really want to get to the point about the potential for a ceasefire, because it was very interesting to hear Laura Hayat, the Israeli Foreign Ministry spokesperson, say that a ceasefire right now would just favor Hamas. I'm wondering what you make of that and what, what we should expect about the potential for a ceasefire in the coming days. Well, you know, uh, Leo Hayat is a, is a good friend that I've known him for many, many years, but I don't think what he said is accurate. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say it uh, very uh, diplomatically. I think we will see in uh, the next uh, 24 hours a beginning of uh, talks to start and see whether ceasefire is a possibility. Uh, this does not mean that the ceasefire will happen tomorrow. Uh, usually it takes, there's a, you know, a breaking distance that you need to go from the point that you start talking about the ceasefire when the ceasefire actually happens. Usually it can take three, four, five days sometimes. But I think that sometime tomorrow we will see a beginning of uh, talks on a possible ceasefire. We are all hoping for those. Barack Ravid, thank you so much for joining us and lending us thank your you expertise. Thank you very much. Thank you.